<laughs> All right. So that was my favorite robot, by the way, Wally. And for all kinds of reasons, but we'll we'll be talking a little bit about Wally during this during this hour. What I'm excited to talk with you about is how to train your robot. And in particular, I'm going to give you a little tour of robots in general, and then talk about robots in my lab and some of the work that we're doing in the in research lab at UC Berkeley. This actually is a is a sketch of our lab that's part of a book, which we'll be getting to in a few minutes. This is actually the real scene in my lab. These are my fantastic students. I have 30 students working in research in my lab. We call it the Auto Lab, and you can visit our lab at automation.berkeley.edu. So the first question for everyone is, what is a robot? So I want everybody to just take a, a moment and just think about what, when, when you hear the word robot, what you just, just think, close your eyes for a minute and think about what comes to mind as a robot. Okay, now open your eyes again, and let's let's think about that. So many of you, it's something like this. Cleaning the rug, ma'am. It's going to be, um, you know, Rosie the Riveter, or a robot like this from Star Wars. We have R2-D2 and BB-8 and uh, C-3PO. Uh, there's also Wally, of course. They're great robots from, from the screen. And I hope many of you are familiar with Big Hero 6. This is one of my other favorite movies and it's very realistic about robots as well. Now, some of you may also picture something like this. These are sort of from a broad category of a little more scary robots. These are robots that are going to hurt us or challenge us or take over the world. Now let's really go to the definition, the in industry, what people, describe as a robot is a, a programmable machine with three or more motors. So this is an example. What you're seeing right here is a robot. So that means it's, it's a machine that has some complexity. It can move, has more than one, mo has more than two motors, and it's programmable. That's extremely important. All right, so these are examples of robots. This is, um, you may know from Lego, Mindstorms and uh, Boost. These are two robots you can buy. They're, the, the Boost on the left is about um, $150 and the one on the right is closer to $300. And these are some other robots. These are robots that are very hard to buy, but um, they're, uh, they're quite beautiful and elegant. So this is the um, example you've probably seen of a robot technology recently. That's an Atlas robot doing a backflip. It's very impressive. And it, this one has been seen by over a million, by over a million people on YouTube. But if we look at the um, back, the outtake of that, this is actually what happens most of the time. The robot doesn't always work. And this is an important theme of my talk today. I want to really explain to you what robots do and also it's important to acknowledge what they can't really do in, in reality. All right, I also want to make this important difference between um, the concept of a robot and a telerobot. Now a robot is self-controlled. That means that you put the robot in some environment and it will move and it will perform operations and do things on its own but a telerobot is remotely controlled. That means that a telerobot is controlled via the, uh, someone is remotely operating it through some kind of a, um, um, a controller. So let's, let's, now this distinction is very, very important and often overlooked. So I really want you to learn this today, which is that a robot and a telerobot might look the same, but they're very different because one, is self-controlled and the other is controlled by a remote person. So this is an industrial arm. Now, is this a robot or a telerobot? Think about it for a minute and the answer is it's a robot, okay? Because it works on its own. It just does things over and over again without being controlled by a human. Let's look at this. So this is another robot and it's using, it's actually um, 
trying to possibly defuse a bomb that might be inside this suitcase. But the clue to this is the, 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 the thing you see in the background there, that's a, uh, that's a human who's operating it, okay? So what is this? Is this a robot or telerobot? Telerobot. Okay, so this is a robot, looks like a robot. If you didn't see that man behind it, you might think it was a robot, but there's a man behind the curtain, if you will, who's operating it, and so it's a telerobot. How about this? Many of you are familiar with the first competition. It's really exciting. It's a, it, it, this is students, high school students from all over the world compete in, in having, building robots to do things like this, throw bas um, basketballs into hoops. Now these, these robots, are they robots or telerobots? The answer is telerobots. And the key is right in the center of that image, you see that student is operating the, the, the robots by controlling them. So they look like robots if you're just looking at them, but there's always a, a person there controlling them. So these are telerobots. And here's another competition. This is a different competition using the Lego system. And we see some students there as well, but uh, in the center we see a robot. And is that a robot or a telerobot? And the answer is that is a telerobot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I got that wrong. That is a robot because there is no, no human controlling it. It's actually got its own controller and its own processors and sensors. And so it's making decisions on its own and the students are just watching it. So that is an example of a, of a robot. So this is so important. I just want to again emphasize that robots are self-controlled and telerobots are remotely controlled. So let's look at these that we, we looked at earlier, robot or telerobot. So just pause for a second. You've seen them on videos, YouTube. The answer is both of these are telerobots. They're controlled by people remotely. They're hoping to get to the point where these can be controlled automatically to be real robots, but they're not there yet. And these are just toys or inexpensive robots for education. But these are real robots. They're not controlled by humans at a distance. They have their own um, sensing and, and computers inside. And so they do their processing and perform actions without human. So they're real robots. How about this one? Here we say that this is a, a I hope you can tell that that's a, that's a human right here. <laughs> but he's interviewing um, this this robot that's called Sophia. And Sophia is not real. She looks a little creepy, um, but she is a, is, is, is been shown all around the world at a number of events and on TV as a robot. But here's a question, is she a robot or a telerobot? And the answer is she's a telerobot. What she's doing is she's being controlled by someone who's, you can't see on the screen here, who's basically hidden, who is basically, who is operating her. So it's really, again, really important to be able to spot and always, if you're not clear, to ask someone, well, is this a robot or is this a telerobot? Because it makes a huge difference. Now, let's talk about um, surgery. So you may have heard about robots doing surgery. People are talking about this. Now, the robot in question is right on the, slightly to the, to the right of the image there. And, um, that would be those little the tips, the tools would be inside the body of a patient as it's doing surgery. And the question is, is this a robot or a telerobot? And I think by now all of you are, will, be, will, will agree that this is a telerobot because of the person, the surgeon sitting to the left. So the surgeon is operating and controlling the robot. And so it's a telerobot and it's, it's a beautiful piece of technology People often call it a robot doing surgery, but it's really important to note that it's a telerobot that's doing the surgery. That's very different than a robot doing the surgery on its own. All right, so let's take a quick look at some of the science behind robots. And now there's gonna, I'm gonna use a couple of big words here. So if you're a young kid and these words sound confusing, don't worry. They're, um, they're things that you would learn typically in college but I'll just, um, just describe them briefly to you. The first one is something called robot kinematics. And this has to do with the positions, the velocities, and the motion of the arm. 
And you can see here on the left, this is a robot arm and it's got a number of joints. And then on the right is all the math. And so this is basically telling you if you're taking a class in trigonometry, pay attention because that turns out to be very, very important for robots. The next piece of science is called dynamics, robot dynamics. And this has to do with the forces and torques that are exerted by robots. So how, how hard they push and in what direction they push and how hard they can twist things. And this has to do with the motors and the, um, again, with, has elements of geometry and trigonometry. Another aspect is, is robot control. And this is, again, a mathematical area that has to do with how we control the robot to make sure that it follows the motions that we want for example, how it will, we can get it to move in a nice smooth arc or in a straight line. So there's a huge body of theory about, about robotics and we teach courses on, on this at Berkeley in the College of Engineering. We have courses in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, industrial engineering, bioengineering in, in different aspects of robotics. And it's a very big and growing field and many faculty are working on research in this area. So there are many opportunities, not only to take classes, but also to get involved in research. Now, by the way, I just wanna ask how, how what, what real robot is most similar to the Wally robot that we were talking about earlier? So I think some of you are gonna know this, but the answer is, the Mars rover. And the Mars rover, as you see on the right there, is a real robot. It's, uh, it's actually sitting on Mars right now. And it's called Curiosity. And it is, if you look at it side by side with Wally, they look surprisingly similar. And the reason is not surprising. It turns out that, um, that the group who designed the Mars rover actually went to visit the group who are working on the movie at Wally at Disney. And during that meeting, they came away with some, they looked at some of the drawings and they wanted their robot to look a little bit similar. So they designed the Mars rover a little bit in, indirectly based on Wally. And so the Mars rover, of course, has a lot more um, complexity to it. And also, but it is impressive that both these robots have been operating on planets uh, for, for many years and continue to work based on combination of power sources. Okay, so let's go back to Wally. And if you remember this um, the great scene where Wally interacts um, with Eva, and um, question is, how, how does Eva see, or how do robots in general see their environment? How do they perceive what's going on? If you remember from um, the film, this is a great scene where they meet, and Eva goes around to look for things, and we'll see in a minute what she does, how she does that. So, by the way, if you remember what she's looking for, she's off searching for a plant, just some kind of um, something that's growing in the environment. But you see what's going on is her eyes are scanning the environment. And that's the important thing I want to point out to you is this idea of being able to scan the environment to look for things. This is something that we, we do use in robotics, and it's called LIDAR. And LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. And what that means is that you can shine light beams out into the environment, you scan the environment, and as the light bounces off, the, off these objects in the environment, you get signals. And that lets you build up a model of what's going on, a three-dimensional model of the world around you. So it, here's one scenario. If you were looking down at a bunch of objects on your desk, for example, on the left, you would see the objects, but on the right, this is how the LIDAR would see them. And what it's showing you is a depth map as we call it, it's a map of the depth of the objects. So you can see when something is far away, it gets dark. And when it's close up, it gets light. So the, that hole in the center on the right, that dark black hole corresponds to the center of the tape that you see on the left. And hopefully you can see how these two things interact. And so the, the depth map is very powerful because it tells you basically the three-dimensional geometry of the objects in the environment. Now, I also want to point out that these, these LIDAR systems, these, these new class of sensors that have really been become increasingly popular in the last decade are not perfect. So it's important to note that they, 
they show you an image of the world, but it's not perfect. As you can see, things are jumping around. There's little holes in the sensors. And this is important to note that the, the, the sensing is, is improving, but it isn't perfect. And this is an important theme in robotics. Now, let's go to oh, Isaac's Three Laws of Robotics. Now, if you haven't read Isaac Asimov's classic book, I, Robot, from 1942, it's a terrific, it's a terrific book. I think any kid over the age of, of 10 or 12 can read it. And it's, it's a great example of, of robotics. Remember, um, this, is, um, this is an early book and it's talking about the idea that um, it basically says there are three laws. And the first one is a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Okay, that makes sense, right? Robots should never injure humans. And then number two is a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders conflict with the first law. Okay, so if one, if you told a robot, go out and punch somebody else, the robot would not be able to do that because that would conflict with the first law, which is cannot injure a human being. And then the third one is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. So it has to take care of itself as long as it is not conflicting with the obeying the orders of others or not injuring any other humans. And in the book, there's all kinds of interesting examples and stories about what those what happens in those three laws, how they come into play and how they can contradict each other and how they get interesting. So I encourage you to take a look at that. It's a really beautiful book and it's not mathematical, but it's using a lot of logic that is really central to the field of robotics. All right now, also I want to address right away for, for many of you, um, the question of will robots take over? Are they going to steal our, all of our jobs and put us all out of work? Especially this is something we worry about at a time like this when we're all basically confined to our homes and so much has changed so rapidly. And the question is, will robots, will robots take over and, and basically wipe out jobs and basically make us all like Wally in the movie Wally, um, that we would have nothing to do but watch TV all day long? And some of this concern is around the area of, of artificial intelligence. And you've been hearing about that. It's been in the news and in, in, in many TV shows and movies and books. And I wanna just put it into context. So a lot of the concern has been around this particular uh, scenario where we have the, a, a robot or a, a, an artificial intelligence system beating the world champion at the game of Go. And the, um, this game is very, uh, very difficult. It's like, think of it as chess, but much more complex. And um, um, the, about five years ago, a computer that was developed by a team at DeepMinds, also owned by Google, beat the world champion at this game. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the game is, is actually, sounds complicated, but it's actually not in the sense that Every, the board is a simple grid of 19 by 19 cells. And at every intersection there, there's a either, there's one of three things can happen. Either there's a black stone, a white stone, or no stone. So there's only three different things that can happen at each point in that space. And the challenge is for you, if you look at that board, and if you're playing black, to decide where to place the next black stone. Now that's non-trivial, but because there's many different things that if you put a black stone in one, one cell, your opponent will put a white stone in another cell, et cetera, and you have to go into this deep tree. So there's a lot of what we call branching factor in this problem, but it's important to note that the state of the system is very well contained. So it's perfectly known and you can represent it essentially in black and white in a binary representation. Now, if we look at um, the real world, as we're talking about here, where we want to have robots operating in environments like this, driving cars in our suburb suburban streets, 
or having robots work in senior citizens, help senior citizens take care of themselves or in warehouses or factories or in operating rooms, then the situation becomes very, very different. The, the state of the system, the state of the world is not nicely contained to a, to a grid. It's actually a very high dimensional system. So the state of the world in, in, the, in, the, real, in the real world is, is far, far more complex. There are many more um, points on a grid, if you will. And each grid is not just black, white, or uh, empty. You actually have hundreds or thousands of values that could be contained at each cell. And on top of that, the world changes. It doesn't sit still and wait for you to make your move. And on top of that, you actually don't even know what the state of the world is because it's, it's not only changing and moving and very complex, but it's also very hard to perceive exactly where everything is in the environment. So all this combines to say that, that games are not reality, that we have made major advances in having machines, robots, and AI systems play games, but that does not at all imply that we can carry this over into solving all these problems in reality. Now I'm going to show you a short video. This is a video that my wife and I made a couple years ago that gives you a little bit of an overview and context for robotics. So I'm going to play it next. It's about, oh, I'm just going to say short. It's just five minutes long, but I think it'll be, you'll enjoy it. It'll give you a good context. Then we'll come back and talk more about some, some more details. All right. And here we go. Let's see if I can get this to play. All right. I'm going to turn up the... Whoop. Wait, all right, technical difficulty, here we go. So do you think robots are gonna surpass humans and take over? No, we don't need to worry about robots surpassing us. That's why I love him, he doesn't believe robots are gonna take over. Actually, the more I learn about robots, the more I realize how far we still have to go. How far back does the history of robots go? It goes back a long way. They say that the ancient Egyptians built moving statues. They were the ones who invented the steam engine. So they were the original steampunks. Yeah, right. Actually, there are countless stories in Eastern and Western culture. The Greeks imagine a statue that comes to life. There's the golem of Prague. You remember Frankenstein. Leading up to C-3PO, an Astro Boy. But where are the real robots, like, in our world today? Well, they're mostly in factories. Actually, now there are over a million industrial robots working on assembly lines, doing things like welding and painting. So those robots are way too busy to be plotting to take over the world. And I have made that dream come true. Lord, you have the greatest creation of man's intelligence. A human robot. <laughs> but one thing we do have to worry about is robot drones. It turns out that robots are better at flying than driving. Why? Because there's a lot more empty space in the air than on the road, so there are more variables. The new drones are agile and essentially invisible, so they can observe and then strike without warning. Which is really friggin' scary. Absolutely. But there are also many applications where robots can be helpful. See, back in the 1950s, we all thought robots would replace humans. We wanted to work less and have more leisure time. But today we want jobs, so we're focusing on robots that can enhance how we work rather than replacing us. So robots that are more like companions than tools. Right. The emphasis now is on robots that can help us with things, like folding laundry, driving our cars, assisting surgeons in the operating rooms to be more precise, even helping people walk. There's all kinds of interesting research being done on robots that cooperate with humans. Well, what about everyday life? I mean, we could certainly use one in our house. What about the robot that I actually can clear our dinner table? Now that turns out to be a surprisingly hard problem. Now, put yourself in the position of being a robot. Everything is out of focus for you. What you see is jittery, confusing. It's very hard to coordinate your sensors and motors. So you're uncertain about your environment and your actions. Nothing is reliable, not even your own body. So when you reach out to pick something up, you feel very clumsy. Right, but there's an exciting new concept called belief space. That sounds so Californian. It does, but it's a mathematical framework that allows robots to analyze uncertainty and to learn over time so they can predict which actions are most likely to succeed. But 
belief space requires a huge amount of number crunching to extract the signal from the noise, which is why we're developing another concept that we call cloud robotics. The idea here is that each robot doesn't have to do all the thinking by itself. Instead, robots connect online over the internet to clusters of computers that do the number crunching. Like what humans are doing, sharing information over the web. Exactly. Robots are now getting on the internet to share data and software. So does that mean that soon robots are going to meet on Robot Grinder or Robot Facebook? Or Inner Facebook? <laughs> or maybe they'll start procrastinating by watching themselves on YouTube. But even with the cloud, robots are still very far from being as graceful as humans. I'm finally getting something that in our whole 17 years together, I don't think I've fully gotten as deeply as right now, which is that all of your art installations, they're really about the gap between what humans can do and what robots can't do. Yes. <laughs> Yay! I that, got you. Because <laughs> that gap is profound. It reveals those things about us that are uniquely human. Like what, what are some of the things that robots can't do? Where do I start? I mean, they don't have intuition, they don't have emotion, they can't be creative. They can't fall in love. They can't fall in love. But that's why robots are endlessly fascinating, because they remind us how vulnerable we are and how amazing we are. I love that. Oh! <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that. That was a that was a, a a fun little overview of some of the things we've already talked about. And now I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you: Can robots be affordable? So the robots we've talked about have been many of them are very very expensive, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars each, and some of them from Lego, as you saw, could be you could buy for three hundred or even one hundred and fifty dollars, but I want to tell you a little story. And to do this, let's go back, let's go to the, the continent of Africa. And in fact, this is where I was born. This is a photo of my parents in the village of Ikene in Nigeria. And uh, there's me in the center of the uh, image with, uh, with our dog at the yeah. time. And what, what happened was that my mother and I went back to Africa. Uh, we went back to Ghana five years ago, and we, we, we met students who were working on robotics. And this is an example of their students all over Africa who love robots in the same way that students all over America and the rest of the world do. And so we were talking with them and the challenge is that the robot that, that we see here was shared from schools from many different regions. So that robot would only be able to be used by the school for a very short time, and then had to be packed up and shipped off to another to another school. And this was unfortunate because robots are so inspirational for students to get excited about science, engineering, technology, and math. So the um, the the idea was, could we could we come up with a new design of a robot that would be very affordable? And so some of the professors at this school. Um, and I came up with this idea of starting the African Robotics Network, and we called it AFRON. And pretty soon we got people from all over Africa to join this, and we raised some money, and we had a competition for designing the what we call the ultra affordable robot for education. And we set a target that we felt was completely impossible of $10 um, US $10 to build a robot that could be programmed and teach students that students could learn from. So um, this, uh, this we, we announced this publicly. We had ended up getting uh, uh, submissions from all over the world. There are about 40 submissions. And among, above, among those, we chose 10. And they were really interesting. They were a range from designs with um, plastic parts to cardboard to all kinds of pieces. But all of them Typically, the, the cost for these robots range from about $100 to $200 to build them, except for one. And this was a brilliant design of an inventor named Tom Tilly, who lived in, in, in Thailand. And his idea was to take an old Sony game controller and modify it by 
turning those little motors inside that are used to vibrate the, um, the controller, turn those around outside and then attach these little wheels as you see here so that it could drive itself around. And the beauty of this is that these, um, these controllers are very inexpensive. They're available even um, in surplus or in landfills today. Um, so they're widely available. And then you can basically use the, the control signal and the wire there to plug that into your computer. The one thing he wanted to do was to make use of those little things on the top, the black thumb switches, so that those would be sensors and respond when the um, robot ran into something, when they bumped into a wall or something. But then when he tried it, they didn't quite respond. So he needed something to have a, a heavier weight on the end of them. So he decided, he thought for a while, and then he came up with a brilliant solution. Two lollipops. So what he did was he attached these two, drill the holes, drill, put two lollipops in the center. Now when he drove it, it would bounce and those lollipops would tilt forward and it would activate the sensors in the thumb switches. And so it would stop. And this is a, such a great idea. I love the insight. And he ended up calling this the Lollibot. And if you go online, you can search for it. Lollibot, you can find all the instructions for how to build your own Lollibot system. And the amazing thing is that because these Sony game controllers are available at such an inexpensive price, they, the entire cost for a Lollibot is $8.64. That includes the two lollipops. <laughs> so it's an amazing result that this, this design um, that, that I don't think anyone at Berkeley or in, in a major robotics companies would have come up with was the result of intuition and ingenuity from someone in a far corner of the world who basically thought up this really clever solution to the challenge. Could we afford, could we design an ultra affordable robot for education? Okay, so now I wanna come back to talking about um, other kinds of robots. This is again, is Atlas doing his, uh, his backflip as we saw. And there's also robots being doing things like this for, um, for <laughs> putting things in, uh, um, this would be in a sort of warehouse scenario. And let's go to the, this book about how, how to train your robot. And this is a book that uh, was written by, with my daughter was involved, and also um, Ashley Chase, who's at the Lawrence Hall of Science here at Berkeley. And it was illustrated by the great Dave Clegg. As you'll see, he's an amazing illustrator. So I'm just gonna go through this book quickly with you. It's, it's about 20 pages, but it's, um, it's written for fourth and fifth graders. So I'll just, ex I'll just read it and then explain it as we go. But it really gives you an insight into really contemporary robotics because it's based on research that we're doing in our lab with the National Science Foundation. So this is the book and you can, you can get a free copy of the book and I'll tell you about that in a minute, but you can also download the, um, the book as um, off the internet, which I'll also give you a link to. So you can um, read it at your leisure, but uh, this is what it looks like. And it was supported by the National Science Foundation and, and UC Berkeley and the Lawrence Hall. And it, it opens with Bluma saying, I love robots. I'm Bluma, I love robots. And oh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to read every bit of it because I have these things on my screen. Let me just try, hold on one second. I'm gonna remove these, put this back up. Great, okay. So, I'm Bluma, I love science, math, dancing, basketball, and roller skating, but my favorite activity is inventing new things, especially robots. And I'm super excited to tell you how to, I figured out the best way to train a robot. I'm the president of the Razzle Dazzle Robot Club. We meet after school in a room we call the Lightning Lab, where we design and build robots. Our robots do hip hop dance moves, escape from mazes, launch water balloons, and other interesting stuff. Once we hit a robot under a cardboard box and it took out it, and it took it out on the schoolyard during recess. We freaked out some fifth graders by making the box move just slightly whenever they walked past it. People said it was the best prank ever. One day, we were in the middle of building a bug ro our bug robots when our club advisor, Mar Mariana, spoiled the fun. Five o'clock, cleanup time, she announced. Cleaning up was the only bad part of robot club. We all wanted to keep, keep working on our robots. But suddenly, I had an idea. Maybe we could do both at once. Let's make a robot that can clean for us. 
We'll can, we can call it Clark, the cleaning robot. The entire club wanted to help and everybody had ideas for building our new robot. The next afternoon, we started work on Clark. Step one was to visit my favorite spot. We called it the Twisted Treasure Closet. It's filled with old machines like computers, phones, TVs, toasters, radios, fans, cameras, popcorn poppers, electric toothbrushes, and lots of motorized toys. Most of the machines don't work anymore, so we just take them apart and use the motors, gears, and other parts for building new inventions. My friends Tyler and Rada picked up something that looked like a giant hockey puck with wheels. It's an old vacuum cleaner, robot vacuum cleaner, said Tyler. It drives around and sucks up dirt. Oh, I saw one in a video, said Rada. Somebody's cat was riding on it. Well, we turned it on and it still worked. We decided that old robot vacuum could become part of Clark. It would be the perfect way for Clark to move around. And then we needed a way to control Clark. And Rada had an idea. She, she remembered that robot vacuums have computers and Wi-Fi connections. So we went online and we found a way to get the club's laptop computer to send commands to the little computer inside Clark. After a few days of work, we got the robot vacuum to follow directions from the laptop computer. And we could use the laptop to steer Clark around the workshop. And the robot did a good job sucking up dust, but it couldn't pick up things like tools and trash. Clark needed a way to clear bigger stuff off the floor. Okay, Brainiacs, time for a club meeting, I called. Anybody have ideas for parts to help Clark pick things up? Well, people came up with all kinds of ideas. Shovels, claws, scoops, suction cups, magnets, and even a laser zapper to blast trash into the dust. Well, I thought the laser zapper sounded really fun, but Tyler said Clark needed to put things away, not destroy them. Anyway, I know that was annoying, but I had to admit he was right. After comparing all the design ideas, we decided to try to scoop out the, the scoop idea first. Now in the, twisted, in the twisted treasure closet, we found a dustpan that would work as a scoop. We also found an old toy truck that you could drive with a remote control. We pulled the motors, pulled out the motors so we could use them to power Clark's arm. We built a robot arm with two motors. We, we bolted the scoop to the arm and then connected the whole thing to Clark. We used the remote control to make the scoop go up and down. And the arm wasn't easy to control, but after a while, Tyler really got the hang of it, and he taught us. He's an ace in video games. Well, in our first experiment, we scattered some foam pa packing peanuts over the floor. We started up Clark and lowered the scoop. The scoop slid under the packing peanuts and picked them up easily. We put a box on one side of the, of the room for Clark to dump the peanuts into. When Clark got near the box, I used the remote to slowly raise the scoop. The problem was that the peanuts didn't fall out onto the box. They just stayed in the scoop. I lowered the scoop and raised it up again, but it still didn't quite work. Then I tried raising the scoop really fast to get the peanuts to pop out. They popped out all right, and the packing peanuts went flying into the air. <laughs> it was just my luck that this was right when Mariana came over to see how we were doing with the testing. She got showered with peanuts. Anyway, that was pretty funny, but she didn't get too mad. Mariana reminded us that workshop cleanup doesn't mean dumping everything into a box. Each object needs to be put away into the right place. So tools go in the tool storage area, trash goes into the trash can, extra parts go into the closet. Don't worry, I said, we'll work on a new design. And sorry about the packing peanuts. Uh, you still got one more stuck in your hair, by the way. So the scoop wasn't working out. Clark needed to be able to pick up things one by one and put each one in the right place. So we started brainstorming different kinds of robot grippers. We drew lots of diagrams to design a, a motorized gripper, and then we worked together to build it. To test the new gripper, we scattered some tools on the floor. Then we took turns driving Clark over to a tool and using the remote controls to make the, the gripper arm pick it up and put it away. Well, some tools were really easy to pick up, but Clark had a lot of trouble picking up other tools. We must have tried about 20 times to get Clark to pick up the hammer. It kept dropping before Clark could put it away. Then Tyler guided Clark to grab the head of the hammer in just the perfect spot so it could pick it up and put it on the tool bench. Finally. Controlling Clark's gripper was fun for a while, but after everybody had taken a turn at the controls, we still had lots of tools left to pick up. It was taking way too long, and we were working even harder than we did before when we cleaned up the lightning lab ourselves. Clark needed to step up and do more of the work. Okay, 
Clark had wheels instead of legs, so Clark couldn't step up exactly, but you know what I mean. So we did another brainstorming session thinking about what Clark would need to clean up without us working on the controls. We realized the computer could operate Clark's motors on its own, but before Clark could pick up an object and put it away, the robot would need to find the object in the first place. Clark needed a way to see. Now Rada was rummaging around the twisted treasure closet when she yelled, Eureka! She had found an old webcam that could send video to a computer. We attached the webcam to Clark and we saw a video pop up on the club computer screen. The video showed the workshop floor. Rada bent down and wiggled her fingers in front of Clark and we saw that the wiggling fingers were on our computer screen. The screen showed the world from Clark's point of view. Clark could see. Well, now it was time to do some coding. In the Rattle Dazzle Robot Club, we had all gotten pretty good at coding, so we wrote up some code to give Clark instructions on how to clean up. This is what we instructed Clark to do. Look at the floor with the webcam and find the objects on the floor. Drive over to an object and pick it up. Go to the tool storage area and put the object down in the correct spot. Find another object and do the same thing. Repeat until there's nothing left on the floor. Sounds super easy, right? Well, it wasn't easy for Clark. Clark could find objects just fine, and he would try to pick them up, but Clark kept dropping things. Because Clark, well, he was a real klutz. Well, we thought maybe the problem was Clark's gripper, so we experimented with different designs. We tested a suction cup gripper and grippers with two jaws, three jaws, and four jaws. We even tried a gripper shaped like a human hand. Each design picked up some stuff, but it dropped other stuff. Some grippers were better at picking up round things, and others were better at picking up squishy things. No gripper was perfect at picking up everything. No matter how much training we did, Clark didn't seem to be getting better at cleaning up. For example, you know that hammer that had to be picked up in just the right way or else it would drop? Well, Clark usually picked it up eventually when the gripper finally happened to close the right way. Still, the next day, Clark would go right back to picking up the hammer the wrong way again. Silly robot, when will you ever learn, said Tyler. Aha, that gave me an idea. Maybe the problem wasn't the gripper, but the coding in Clark's robot brain. Clark needed to be able to learn things, to learn how to pick things up. So Tyler went online and he searched robot learning. A bunch of stuff popped up on the screen, but one thing on the list really caught my eye. A robot lab at the university in our town. In their lab, Professor Mason and his students were investigating how to get robots to pick things up, just like we were. I could hardly believe it. We told Mariana about it, and she set up a field trip for us to go and visit Professor Mason's lab. Walking into Professor Mason's lab was amazing. It was a lightning lab in overdrive. I counted eight different robots around the room. Everywhere, robot arms were reaching for things. While he was showing us around, Professor Mason told us about robot learning. Robots usually do only what people tell them to do, Professor Mason said. They just follow instructions. But in the last few years, researchers are starting to build robots that can learn from experience, like Dexter over here. We call it deep learning. Professor Mason brought us over to a robot with a pair of robot arms. Want to try it out? He asked me pointing to my special plastic keychain shaped like a shark. I dropped it in front of Dexter's robot arms and one of the robot arms reached right down and picked it up. Wow. Dexter has never picked up a shark shaped object like this one before, said Professor Mason. And we didn't code Dexter for this object. Instead, we wrote code that gave Dexter the ability to learn. Dexter can pick up new things now because it is practiced the best way to pick up millions of objects with different shapes. Well, it must have taken forever to get Dexter to do all that practicing, I said, thinking of Clark. Professor Mason replied, great point. Actually, the practicing went really fast because all of it was simulated on a computer. I was starting to understand. It's like Dexter dreamed about picking up lots of different things, and that's how it learned. Exactly, said Professor Mason. That's how this robot learned to pick up objects of almost any shape. Even a hammer? Asked, Taylor, asked Tyler. We explained all about Clark the cleaning robot and how much trouble it was having picking up our hammer. Professor Mason and his students dug out some tools in different shapes and we did some experiments with them. Dexter picked up some tools but dropped others. 
Professor Mason and his students got really interested in this challenge and they said they would help us. We're almost done. For days, the Razzle Dazzle Robo Club was trying to guess how Professor Gold and his students were gonna help us. Maybe they'll send Dexter over to teach Clark a few new tricks, Vrata joked. A, few, a week later, we got an email from Professor Mason with a file attached. In the email, he explained that the file had code in it to help Clark start learning from practice. We couldn't wait to try it. We installed the new code on Clark. Then we put some tools on the floor and started Clark up. Clark moved toward a hammer and started reaching for it, but Clark was reaching for the middle of the hammer again. I carefully glided, guided Clark's gripper up high near the head of the hammer so that it wouldn't drop. We took turns showing Clark the best way to pick up the new tools. Then Clark started experimenting on its own. Five o'clock, cleanup time, said Mariana. There were still some tools on the floor. We begged Mariana to let us keep working with Clark. We watched as Clark taught itself how to pick the tools up. When Clark finally picked up the hammer without dropping it, we cheered and we gave each other high fives. Well, soon the floor was completely clean. From now on, Clark would help us keep the lightning lab clean. We were learning about Clark, and Clark was learning about us. So what's the best way to train a robot? Teach it to train itself. End of story. So then there's a little glossary describing some of the terms in there, and then there's a little bit more information about, um, about the authors. So I wanted to share that with you because I really am um, proud of that story. That, um, that picture there is of, um, that's Bluma Goldberg, she was my daughter, and she was uh, nine years old when uh, she helped me work on this book. So um, we have a lot more to say. We only have about 10 minutes left, and I wanna make sure I have time for your questions. Again, I wanna give you a quick pop quiz here, the difference between a robot and a telerobot, and um, which is, uh, are these uh, robots or telerobots? The answer is robots. Uh, no, telerobots, <laughs> and these are robots, okay? They are self-control. Okay, so let's take a break and take a few questions, and then I have more to tell you if there's time. So let's see, I'm going to go over here, open up the um, Q&A in the participant list. Great, and if you don't have questions, then I'm going to continue. Um, I have a few more things to say. Oh, while we do that, let's put this back up. This is a, a link. It's um, j.mp slash how, how dash to dash train dash your dash robot dash book, um, just like there. And if you go to that website, you'll, you'll be able to find a link. Um, there'll be more information and then also a link to where you can download a copy of it as a PDF. So you can read it on your, um, on your, on your iPad or on your home computer. And this is my my contact information if you want to reach me through email or on twitter and oh i got a question great it says uh where do you work on your research so i work on a lab right on campus it's in etcherbury hall on the north side of campus near hearst street and it is um it's a lab that has very much like looks like what you saw in the um in the book we have eight robots in fact at one point, um, we, we had more robots than students in the, uh, in the lab. So um, we're, we're always collecting robots and doing experiments with them. Unfortunately, right now, we can't do any work um, because of the, of the COVID-19 shutdown. And in fact, that's what I wanted to talk with you a little bit more about if we have time. So if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to go a little bit further. We have about 10, five or 10 minutes left. Oh, I want to also mention, if you're interested in learning more, in addition to um, information on the book and on our lab, this, um, this website is a great source of examples of robots. It has hundreds of robots and lots of information about each one of them. It's called ro at robots.ieee.org. -E -E and it is a fantastic site. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's really got lots of interesting information and it's, they're, or, they're organized by all kinds of categories, robots for work, robots for driving, robots for your home, robots you can hug, as you can see here. All right, well, how else can robots help us? So, you know, I don't know about you, but this might be how your kitchen looks 
uh, let's say after you made breakfast, wouldn't it be great if you could then, let's say, go off somewhere and come back an hour later and your kitchen is nice and clean like this. So this would be an ideal setting. Um, and it, it would be great if we could do that, but it turns out that humans are much more capable, much more dexterous than robots are. So this is an example, as we, as we talked about in the, in the book, that humans have great dexterity, but robots still really don't. And um, I'm, this, is a, this is very relevant today, by the way, because, of the, because we're all in quarantine because of COVID-19, and the, uh, we're relying on deliveries for, for far more than we did um, two months ago. And this is a typical scene outside um, someone's house where they're getting deliveries all day long. And we're really relying on this in new ways. And the challenge is how are we fulfilling these orders? How do we get the deliveries? How does that actually all work? And this is typical, you have a scene where you have workers who are wearing masks, but they're working in warehouses and it's very compact. There's not a lot of um, spacing between people so there's creating a, a real challenge of how do you find enough workers to meet this increased demand when workers have to either stay at home or um, maintain a safe distance between them, between each other. So for example, this was reported just, um, this is two months ago, but it's even gotten more extreme. The demand has gone up for, for, for e-commerce and companies like Amazon are hiring workers as fast as they can, but there's still a need. Can they have, can we use robots to assist in delivering orders? It won't replace all the people again. I don't believe that's going to happen, but I think it's going to be essential to provide the, to meet the demand that we're facing today. Now, a grand challenge for robotics is the ability to grasp an arbitrary object. So that's what we were talking about earlier in the, in the Clark story, how do you pick up, how do we get robots to be able to pick up anything like as you see in that picture on the right? In other words, why are robots still clumsy? And let me show you this little video. It shows you this is a, what it would look like if you were a robot. So the, your noise, your sensors are not very good and your motors are not very accurate. And so, and there's also uncertainty in the physics itself. So it makes it very difficult for robots to be able to do something as simple as just picking things up to clean up after, um, after dinner. So there's all kinds of nuance here. What I wanna summarize it is by saying that the uncertainty arises from the physics, from the perception, and from the control. And all of these combine together to have enormous uncertainty in the, robot, in the robot's hand. And so there's another question that came in, how many years do you think it will be before robots can train themselves? And the answer to that is actually that we're getting close. Robots are starting to train themselves. They're getting better. And there's still lots of new questions that have to be asked and answered before they'll really reach the, the kind of level that humans have for being able to pick things up. So there's a gap between what robots can do and what humans can do. Robots are starting to get to, to train themselves to, to, to make progress, but the gap is still fairly large. And I think it's going to be decades before we have a robot that's as capable as a human. The good news is that this is going to require lots of ingenuity and new research from the students who hopefully are watching. I'm very confident seeing the students that I have in my lab, that there's students out there who are maybe now in, in, in elementary school reading books like this and starting to get excited about robots and that they're gonna be the future generations of roboticists who are gonna really solve these problems and address them. Now, I have a lot more to say, but we're just out of time. So I'm gonna invite you, I'm just gonna go through some of these slides very quickly just to um, show you that this is actually the robot that we described in the book and is actually working in our lab. Um, this is, um, I'll just show you it running for a second here. The, um, here it is. This is a robot. That's the what we call Dexter in the book, but this is the real system. We call it DexNet that's operating in our lab, and it's able here to, to pick up objects out of a bin, and we are dumping down objects that it's never seen before, and it just routinely basically goes through and clears every single item out of that bin. 
It's using a combination of a suction cup and a robot gripper to do that. So this is developed by students in my lab over the last five years and now is a is a is the center of a robot company uh, startup company that's um, that's operating near Berkeley in Emeryville. And again, it comes out of the, the what we showed you show in the book is that this is inspired by the same idea of the um, of robots that can interact um, in by, by basically dreaming or thinking about their interactions before they perform them. All right, so we're out of time and I greatly appreciate so many people staying to the end. It was great to have you here. Uh, I see Ashley Chase is on uh, is on the list of, uh, of um, attendees and she was the uh, the, uh, I want to acknowledge her as the co-author of this book. I'm so glad she's here. And I want to thank everyone who put this together, um, who, who organized and uh, made this possible. And um, I hope that I'll get to meet many of you at Berkeley in the future, in person, hopefully. And um, go Bears. <laughs>